Good day, everyone. We are the Group 2 General Science Majors, and we will be presenting the Unit 2, which is entitled Curriculum Planning, Design, and Organization. My name is Demsi Roden B. Puno, and I will be your first presenter. As future educators, curriculum planning is important to ensure that the learning experiences for the students are meaningful and relevant. Teachers use curriculum planning to structure appropriate levels of challenge and multiple entry points, which allow all the students to develop their skills, understanding, and knowledge. There are five elements needed in curriculum designing. Under behavioral objectives or intended learning outcomes, curriculum aims, goals, and objectives is the starting point in curriculum development. The institutional vision, mission, and goals guide the school in their entire operation. This should be the anchors from which the curricula should revolve. An intended learning outcome should describe what students should know or be able to do at the end of the course that they couldn't do before. Intended learning outcome should be about student performance. A good intended learning outcome shouldn't be too abstract, too narrow, or be restricted to lower level cognitive skills. Each individual intended learning outcome should support the overarching goal of the course, that is, the thread that unites all the topics that will be covered and all the skills students should have mastered by the end of the semester. The second element is the content or the subject matter. A curriculum will not be complete without this element. It refers to the body of knowledge that needs to be taught and skills to be acquired by the students. The curriculum content is based on our intended learning outcomes. This is the example of content or the subject matter. We have to remember three things in selecting content. It should be relevant to the level of the lesson or unit. It should be appropriate to the level of the lesson or unit. And it should be up to date and if possible, it should reflect current knowledge and concepts. Let's proceed to the criteria on how to select learning content. Number one is self-sufficiency. The students must attain maximum self-sufficiency in learning, but in the most economical manner. For example, writing lectures during the discussion will lead the students to learn on their own and at their own pace. Number two is significance. It will contribute to the development of the learning abilities, skills, processes, and attitude of the learner to attain holistic learning. Number three is validity. Is the subject matter authentic or is it already obsolete? So we have to check always the authenticity of the content, like searching recent findings of researches and new trends in education, science, and technology. Number four is interest. We have to find out what is interesting for our students by also considering their developmental level as well as their background. Number five is utility. As a future teachers, we must assure our content will be useful in the life of our students at present or in the future. Number six is learnability that the range of the experiences of the students are within. We have to consider their grade level and developmental level. And last is the feasibility. We have to be realistic in including content to be taught in our class by determining our subject matter that can be learned within the time allowed, resource available, our expertise, and developmental level of the students. Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Kit Bernardo and I'm going to present to you the principles in the organization of learning content and the reference. What knowledge is truly really essential in enduring? What is worth teaching and learning? How can students be helped in the construction of a more enriched knowledge base? What strategies can be employed for teaching, conceptual understandings, thinking skills and the different levels and values? Now let's talk about the principles in the organization of learning content. In the case of curriculum designing, Content is organized in order to ensure ease and efficiency of learning on the part of the students. Effective organization of content will also guarantee that the most learning competencies as stated in the curriculum will be acquired by students. Consider the following principles in the effective organization of the content is the balance, articulation, sequence, integration, and continuity. Now let's talk about a balance. Balance is the equitable and fair distribution of content among different levels of instruction. Articulation, the provisions for establishing the vertical linkage from level to level. Articulation prevents clearing gaps between levels. Sequence, it is the sequential and graded arrangement of subject matter. Integration, the horizontal link of content in subject areas. And lastly, continuity, it is the constant repetition, review, and reinforcement of learning. The third element is the reference. 
Reference follows the content. It tells where the content of subject matter has been taken. Reference may be a book, a module, or any publication. It must be that the author of the material, if possible, the publications. What is teaching and learning methods? These are meaningful learning activities where students derive experiences and learning which help them internalize learning to arrive at the learning outcomes. According to Bilbao, it should allow cooperation, competition, as well as individualism or independent learning among students. These are a few examples of activities that can be used in teaching and learning methods. Cooperative learning activities, independent learning activities, competitive activities. Now, the last element on planning a good curriculum design is assessment and evaluation. What's the difference? It may be similar and interchangeable in some occasion and both are essential in curriculum design. But in educational term, evaluation refers to collecting, analyzing, synthesis, and interpretation of information to make judgments about students' learning. While assessment refers to summarizing, interpreting data, to determine which or what strategies to implement to further enhance the learning experience. Evaluation is needed to see if a program is effective throughout its implementation. This would assist educators decide whether to change or eliminate an entire curriculum or a particular educational material. A simple way for curriculum evaluation process. There are actually different models of curriculum evaluation that may school utilize if they would like their curricula to be subjected to evaluation. Bilbao et al. 2015 suggested another way of evaluating a curriculum. These questions will guide us to have a good curriculum evaluation. Number one. Does the curriculum emphasize learning outcomes? Because the learning outcomes will be the guide of the teacher to monitor the student's learning. Number two, does the implemented curriculum require less demand? When you're going to implement a curriculum, it should be more demand so that it can be useful. Number three, can this curriculum be applied to any particular level? Kindergarten, elementary, secondary, or tertiary levels because you need to consider the different learning competencies in different particular levels. Therefore, can the curriculum aspect be assessed as written, taught, supported, tested, and learned? Curriculum may not only be assessed in one method. You need to cater the diverse learning ability of the learners. Number five, does the curriculum include formative assessment? for us to evaluate the learner's learning. Number six, does the curriculum include summative assessment? You need to sum up all the knowledge of the learners. Number seven, does the curriculum provide quantitative method of assessment? It offers the myriad data such as structured interviews, questionnaires, and tests. Number eight, does the curriculum provide qualitative method of assessment? information that yield results that can easily be measured by or translated into number. Number nine, the curriculum provide the data needed for decision making. The system encourages learners participation in corporate decision making. Number 10, are the findings of evaluation available to stakeholders? It should be feasible to implement. Regardless of the methods and materials evaluation will utilize, a suggested plan of action for the process of curriculum evaluation is introduced. These are the steps. Number one, focus on one particular component of the curriculum. Number two, collect or gather the information. Information is made up of data needed regarding the object of evaluation. Number three, organize the information. Number four, analyze information. Number five, report the information. And number six, recycle the information for continuous feedback, modifications, and adjustment to be made. In the classroom context, the teacher is responsible in designing the assessment task together with the formulation of objectives, determination of meaningful learning experiences, and appropriate content. According to the Guzman E. et al. 2015, there are three interrelated purposes of assessment.
knowledge of these powerful cells and how they fit in the learning process can result to a more effective classroom management. Number one is assessment for learning. Teachers provide feedback to the student about their learning and how to improve. Number two, assessment as learning. Students use self-assessment and teachers' feedback to reflect on their learning, consolidate their understanding, and work toward learning goals. Number three, assessment of learning. Assist teacher to use evidence of student learning to assess student achievement against learning goals and standards. There are three types of curriculum design models. These are subject-centered design, learner-centered design, and problem-centered design. Subject-centered design focuses on the content of the curriculum. It corresponds mostly to the textbook written for the specific subject. Thus, this type of design aims for excellence in the subject matter content. Under the subject-centered design, there are three. One is the subject design, which focuses on the cluster of content. Two is the discipline design, focuses on academic disciplines. Three is the correlation design, comes from a core correlated curriculum design that links separate subject designs in order to reduce fragmentation. And number four, the broad field design is also known as the interdisciplinary design. It designs in such a way that the compartmentalization of subjects is avoided. The second type of design is the learner-centered design. The learner-centered design advocates that the learner should be the center of the educative process. It has three subtypes, namely child-centered design, experience-centered design, and humanistic design. The child-centered design is anchored on the needs and interests of the child. The experience-centered design is similar to the child-centered design. It proposes that the interests and needs of the learner cannot be pre-planned. The humanistic design, on the other hand, draws on the development of self as the ultimate objective of learning. The last design model is the problem-centered design. It draws on a more progressive view of the curriculum and has two types, the life situation design and the core designs. Life situation designs ensures that the contents are organized in ways that allow students to clearly view problem areas clearly. On the other hand, the core design centers on general education and the problems are based on common human activities. And now for the approaches to curriculum design. From the above mentioned types of curriculum design, how would the teacher approach each curriculum design? Each curriculum is to be approached by the teacher based on its type. The common approaches to curriculum design includes child or center learner approach. This approach to curriculum design is based on the underlying philosophy that the child is the center of the educational process. Next is the subject-centered approach. The primary focus is the subject matter. The emphasis is on bits and pieces of information which are detached from life. The subject matter serves as means of at identifying problems in living. Third is the problem-centered approach. This approach is based on a curriculum design which assumes that in the process of living, children experience problems. The curriculum mapping process. Curriculum mapping is a process for collecting and recording curriculum-related data that identifies core skills and content taught, processes employed, and assessments used for each subject area and grade or program level. In the tertiary level, a curriculum map is a tool to validate if a match exists between core program outcomes and the content of a curriculum program. In a curriculum map, the following letter symbols are used, L, P, and O. L refers to learned outcomes such as knowledge, skills, and values or outcomes achieved in the subject. This demonstrates whether the subject course facilitates learning of the competency. Thus, input is provided and competency is evaluated. P denotes to practice outcomes. This shows whether the subject course allows the students to practice the competency prescribed. Thus, no input is provided but competency is evaluated. O signifies opportunity to learn and practice. This presents whether a subject course is an opportunity for development. This represents opportunities to learn and practice knowledge, skills, and values, but they are not taught formally. Thus, there are no input or evaluation, but competency is practiced. Here is the process in curriculum mapping for higher education. Number one, make a matrix or a spreadsheet. Number two, identify the degree or program outcomes. Number three, identify subject, 
courses under the degree. Number four, list the subjects along the vertical cells of the matrix in a chronological logical manner. Number five, list the subject degree or program outcomes along horizontal cell. Number six, cross the subject and the outcomes. Determine if such subjects accomplishes the outcomes. Number seven, fill up the cells. Number eight, after accomplishing the map, use it as a guide for all teachers teaching the course for students to complete the degree in four years. This matrix below shows a general curriculum map for the Bachelor of Secondary Education major in science using sample subjects only. L for learned outcomes, P for practice the learned outcomes, O opportunity to learn and to practice. P01 demonstrates deep understanding of scientific concepts and principles. P02 stands for apply scientific inquiry in teaching and learning. And lastly, P03 utilizes effective science teaching and assessment methods. In the basic education level, a curriculum map is the documentation and discussion of what is being taught. It is a collaborative process that helps teachers understand the interaction of teaching and learning process. And that's all for our report. Good day and keep safe, everyone.